Cells and to uh, our afternoon panel discussion uh, with uh, Rob, Susanna, and uh, Cynthia today. Carolyn! Carolyn! Hello! Why do I keep doing this? <laughs> it's okay. Forgive me, Carolyn. Yeah, you are forgiven. Forgive me. <laughs> what we're going to do this afternoon is have an opportunity for our uh, keynote speakers today to engage in a little bit of a discussion with one another. Uh, to share some of their insights uh, that uh, they've been making today in their keynote addresses, but to have that in a dialogue form. And uh, we also want to open up the opportunity for you to talk with them. And so what we'll do, uh, we'll begin this way. We will have uh, one question, uh, which each of the panelists will have an opportunity to uh, address and then to uh, dialogue with each other for a, a little bit. And then uh, we want to open this up for a conversation with you. So if you have some questions that you've been thinking about during the uh, discussions this afternoon, you're welcome to also uh, uh, add your thoughts. Or if something comes out from the discussion that we have from the initial question, please go ahead and uh, share your thoughts with us. What we ask is that if you have a question, please, we need to make sure that you come to a microphone or that a microphone gets to you because we are streaming uh, the audio and we're also recording uh, uh, these proceedings and so we need to make sure that your voice is taken into account and recorded alongside everyone else's. So uh, we'll begin with one question and uh, then we can begin a greater dialogue with everyone here. So why don't we go ahead and get started. This is the question for each of our three panelists. So with climate change and all our impending challenges that we face today, Everybody talks about connecting the dots, putting the pieces together. We face a big, complicated, interconnected crisis. But what connections aren't we seeing? What are the dots, what are the pieces that are critically important to connect today? Panels? Carolyn, do you want to be okay. No. Did it happen? Okay. <laughs> it's organized. Uh, well, one of the things. Are you, are you going? Yeah. I was confused. Okay. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Uh, well, I know a few years ago, one of the dots that were not being connected was the environmental justice movement. So you had more of a mainstream environment uh, movement looking about climate change and not actually those that were directly impacted by climate change. Uh, that we're seeing, uh, I would just say, most impacted uh, by climate change. Because when you were looking at the floods, uh, for example, Katrina, those, uh, the people were very vulnerable. They didn't have the way to get out of those particular situations. And just on October of 31st, we had a major flood in Austin, in East Austin, where we had people stranded also for hours and hours. So when we look at that impact, uh, we know I, I recognize that we have to, one of the dots is missing is the poor. The poor and the working poor are not, uh, are not being brought into the whole issue of climate change uh, and looking at the whole issue of climate justice. I think that it needs to be expanded as far as climate change and climate justice uh, can make a big difference as to who's involved and who's at the table. Uh, the other thing I have to acknowledge is that uh, when we talk about climate and the environment, it's, look, um, it's looked at something that is elitist or it's somebody, it, righteous people, people with money, people who have the access to travel from here to there, uh, uh, who can do things with a lot of resources that the poor and the working poor can't do. And don't acknowledge that the poor and the working poor have always been the ones, uh, leaders, whether it's recycling, whether it's reusing, whether it's not wasting, turning off the light switches all the time, and not, not for the same reason, but because they couldn't afford it. And so I have always been very thrifty and uh, very uh, conscious 
about the cost and what's going on around them. And so I think that the big dot that we have to connect is one is that we've got to break down that barrier of language of how we address the whole issue of climate change or climate justice. And that we acknowledge that poor people have always been at the forefront of taking care of the earth uh, and being real resourceful with the limited uh, resources that they have. And I think that that's a big um, uh, dot that we have in indigenous people uh, throughout the world, that we have to make sure that they too are at the table and that they too are part of the we uh, that was talked about earlier. I can probably talk loud enough, actually, without the mic. And so. <laughs> um, okay. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of jokes I can make about that. Um, okay. I so I wrote down a couple of words. Uh, so the first thing I start thinking of when if the idea of connecting the dots for me assumes a framework that we all agree with. And so for me, that's the first challenge is that, you know, what framework where the dots are being connected because we all don't have the same way of relating to the world, being in the world, showing up day to day, and the world doesn't see us all the same. So I don't even call that a dot. I just call that a way we're framing how we even have this conversation. Um, also, in looking at climate change, doesn't mean that I would, I would venture a guess that it doesn't mean the same for everybody here in this room. So what do we mean when we say climate change? Who are we talking about? Where are we talking? Are we talking about some statistics? Is it some, you know, the changes in the ocean and all? I mean, what does that mean? It means different things to different people. How do we break that down? I'm um, sort of embedded for me the way I heard the idea of connecting the dots is the idea of relationship. And I actually think that's where we need to be focusing on relationship and relationships of reciprocity. The idea that it's not simply about my going into a quote unquote less privileged community with the resources that I have and doing any kind of outreach. I actually don't like to use the word outreach anymore. I think it's outdated and I think that it denies the creative um, capacity of those communities and those individuals um, and their knowledge that they already have. And if we talk about reciprocity, it means, and this is sort of the second thing for me, the idea of doing an assessment of our own capacity, our own cultural, you know, um, what degree of cultural competency do we have to work across difference, and what is our capacity to do that, either as individuals or organizations or, or institutions. When organizations often ask me to come in and say who are doing environmental work, work around climate change, um, they immediately want actions, and I understand they have a certain amount of funding, they last a certain amount of time, like we gotta do it now, give us those bullet points. And I'm like, you need to stop. Because you first need to do an assessment here because you could end up doing more harm than good unless you know what you can actually do and where you need to actually learn. The last thing I want to say on that is the idea about the tension. For me, tension is always often used as something negative. If there's tension between each other, between different groups, between different organizations, between us and the earth, uh, that that tension is a bad thing. And for me, tension is a good thing. Tension is about energy. You know, the earth ecosystems don't exist without that tension. A friend of mine always reminds me of things like the butterfly breaking out of a cocoon. It can't do it without the tension. And so the idea that we have to learn how to stand in that tension better, it's not about making the tension go away. It's about how we're able to be upright in that tension and how do we do that well. <clears throat> Is that tension or electricity? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, you know one of the things that I um, clearly we need to do, and we is always uh, you know in in quotes, um, is to find uh, and access different ways of living in environmental time. And there are enormous numbers of communities across the planet who are doing that and who have made headway doing that. Um, and I was thinking about, uh, I was reading an interview with, with Leanne Simpson from uh, Idle No More, and she was talking about extractive time and the perils of living in extractive time, the idea that you, you plunder once as fast as you can 
and that's the idea of growth, that's the idea of wealth, uh, without thinking uh, in the long term and, and, and judging on that basis what constitutes wealth and poverty on the basis of, of just sort of material plunder in the present. Uh, and at the same time I was reading a book by Arundhati Roy, uh, who many of you know as an Indian writer and activist, called Walking with the Comrades, and it's about the Naxalite movement, um, uh, primarily forest people in India who have militantly opposed assimilation by the Indian state. And while she opposes the violence that some of the Naxalites have been involved in, what she tries to get at is their reasoning for not wanting to be absorbed into the Indian state, the neoliberal state, on the developmental terms that are being dictated to them. And those developmental terms involve cutting down the forest, privatizing, corporatizing. Uh, and, and, I, and she said, uh, you know, maybe we have something to learn from the Naxalites in the rest of India about other ways of inhabiting time. Uh, and that we shouldn't judge these people for being poor or resistant to development because their ways of thinking about time and growth are not our ways. And I was reading these two things together and I was reminded, you know, there are a lot of people in different parts of the world, different communities, uh, who are thinking about uh, inhabitable time differently. Uh, even to take a very, very different example, uh, I was thinking of the Norway Sovereign Fund. Now, as many of you know, the, the Norwegian economy has been built largely on oil. But there, uh, the, the, the policy there was that the oil revenues would be banked for future generations. And only 4% of the revenues would be uh, ex used in the, the current budgetary year. Uh, and so they have, I don't know how, how, how many, 700 billion in this, in this fund. And yes, it's oil, it's a problem. But still, the idea that when you drill for oil, the um, security uh, services, the, the safety nets, uh, the educational investment and so forth from today's drilling belong to children three, four generations from now is pretty radically different way of viewing a resource. Uh, so, the, you know, if we look at, at Germany, how it got to 20% renewables, uh, there are many examples of why a, a country like Portugal, which is a relatively cheap country, can get further than the United States. Um, why in 2012 there were 55,000 environmental protests in China alone, okay? And a lot of those are, are saying, yes, uh, there's this, this uh, vision of growth, but look at the environmental cost for us in our communities. This is not sustainable and so forth. So I think connecting the dots uh, among these different uh, communities, many of them indigenous, some of them not indigenous, uh, and trying to, to deepen and broaden those conversations is a very, uh, is a very crucial thing for us to do. Uh, and one of the things that I, I notice certainly in the, in the national electoral debates is how seldom and, and, and how difficult it seems to be for politicians uh, in either party uh, to allude to successful things outside of America without seeming unpatriotic. Uh, and so I would love to see politicians start by saying, yes, America is the greatest. Uh, uh, and end by saying, yes, America is the greatest, but just to sneak in through the back door, uh, hey, they're doing this thing in Amsterdam or in Nigeria, and hey, it's radical and interesting, and maybe as Americans, we can patriotically pay attention, you know? Uh, so, so that's one thing. I, I don't know, you, you know better than I do what, what that's all about, but anyway. <laughs> What we'd like to do is uh, open this up uh, right now for uh, maybe a few questions from you all uh, to our panelists. So if you don't mind, we have microphones on either end of the uh, aisles here. Uh, if you could uh, make your way to one of them 
and we'll take some. Uh, and so we have some, um, some requests in your questions. First, if you could indicate uh, uh, to whom uh, you would like your question to be addressed, whether to uh, Carolyn, Susanna, or Rob, or to all of them, if you'd like all of them to respond. Um, we would also ask that you ask only one question, <laughs> one question per person, and please limit your comments leading up to the question. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, we have time to uh, include everyone and as many people as possible. And so please uh, make sure you have one question uh, per person and uh, tell us who you would like to hear from. So um, why don't we go ahead and we'll begin over here. Introduce yourself and, and give us your question. Uh, my name's Kirk Schlesinger from around here, but I used to teach at a historically black college called Wilberforce University, which I'm very proud of. And they were proud of me. But anyway, that's another story. I mean, I'm not supposed to tell stories. So. <laughs> I'm wearing a badge here that says one simple idea. Now, I'm an academic like you are. You all are up there. And that's tough because we always want to look for complications and subtleties. And that's wonderful. And it keeps us alive and keeps us teaching. But ultimately, if we are to have those connected dots, we need one simple idea. What you got? Oh, I got an answer. Got an answer? Yes. You didn't say who, so I just assumed. Oh, that's all. I, I, I'll take an answer wherever it comes from. <laughs> um, okay. Actually, I'm not. And avoid an fascism, so, no, please. No, no, that's all right. I'm not an academic. I work in academia. There's a difference. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a person first, and so I come to the table with a set of complexities and a history and a legacy that I think is important, not just because it's mine, because it's a, a, for a lot of people. Um, I, I think I can appreciate the idea of one simple idea, because I think what I can appreciate is the idea that if we can get a critical mass behind a really powerful idea, there can be a big movement to happen. So I, I, I don't want to deny that possibility. And I don't think we're the same world we were. The idea of one charismatic leader, the idea of one idea being enough, I think this is the time when we have to build up our skills to have multiple great ideas. The, uh, the three of us here at this table are just these three people. We're three different people with different agendas. We come from different communities. I think all are valid. And I think by, by narrowing in on one idea, we are in danger of doing what we've always done, which we always, always, always marginalize a whole lot of folks and a whole lot of ideas and a whole lot of possibility. So, so how are we going to avoid that? You need the simplicity, but you got to avoid that. How? And you can say, I, I don't I know yet. Let's talk now, because. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you, Ben, you don't have to respond. Okay, you asked your question, but my whole thing should be the difference between want and need. What do you really need versus what do you want? And I think a lot of time we've gotten into this whole, um, bought into this whole thing of wanting things. And I know I always, I always tell my kids and my grandkids, is it something you want or something you need? Because you need to know the difference between needing something and wanting something. Because that's an impact on the things that you don't, that you just want, and there's a cost to all of that versus what you really need. And that will send people back outdoors when you say the things that you really need. The wanting, all these gadgets keeps you locked up inside when there's a beauty outside. So I think recognizing that is very important. Yeah, I would agree uh, that um, I teach public writing in the MFA program. So I, all my life I've, I've been worked as a journalist and I've, and I've shuttled between the the academy and public sphere. Uh, and to use an academic term, uh, people sometimes talk about strategic essentialism. In other words, when you're fighting a struggle, you're fighting it at different levels. And there are times when you cringe and you simplify because you need a slogan, because you need alliances that are often unstable around the edges. Uh, and so it's not simplicity versus complexity, but it's layers of complexity and neither the simplicity nor the complexity is adequate. And I think strategically, 
we're constantly moving among those levels. Uh, and so there are times, and you know, fairly recently in the Madison protests, we, we had that uh, struggle of very different groups of people coming to oppose uh, the, 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 the environmental cuts, the, the cuts to, to um, public unions and so forth that the, the governor of Wisconsin at the time was, was implementing. And we, were we, we tried to find a common language for that. And interestingly, in Wisconsin, the, the word that people mobilized around the, most effectively was not justice, but decency. Decency became a very political word. And it brought in the environmentalists, it brought in the Marxist organic farmers, it brought in <laughs> the trade unionists, and so forth. So in that situation, there was a radical simplicity to that. Is that translatable or transportable to all situations? No. But it, it, it was effective in bringing people together. And so I just feel that there's a kind of a concertina thing that, that goes on. Sometimes we need to complicate, sometimes we need to simplify. Hello, um, my name is Jim Plunkett. Um, room full of uh, climate people here. You, if you ask, um, if they'd be in, to shut down fossil fuels if they'd be willing to do without gasoline, they all say, you bet. Um, for Carolyn, well, maybe for everybody. Uh, um, the Chevron refinery at Richmond, California should close in, say, 10 years. Um, question is, can you imagine what a campaign would, could you design a campaign that would shut that refinery down in 10 years? It's a community. You a job maybe you, maybe <laughs> you know what Richmond is. How, you know, I imagine it's 15,000 people around, living around the refinery. There's a couple hundred of them work at the refinery and um, they've had a fire there uh, that damaged the community five years ago or so. And uh, um, every time the community starts to move in the wrong direction, uh, they buy off the city council. and. Has been going on a long time, and the Sierra Club asked all the members uh, recently what they might do to build diversity in the Sierra Club. So I just want to make sure. Thank you. I heard two two questions. Oh, no, 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 just, no, 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 just one. Just one. I just it's clarification for myself. Um, because, uh, what can Sierra Club do to I, I, address yeah, diversity? Okay is a different question than what um, a movement might look like around Chevron, um, against Chevron in Richmond. Um, I don't know much about, I mean, I know that all those, all what you just said I know exists. I actually would never, I, I can't presume to come in and think that I would know what to do. But what I can say is that I think it would have to be a, um, when I say community effort, I mean, you know, not there being no one person who's the person who's deciding what it is we do, because actually the people who've been living there probably know best of all what is happening to them. And so for me, it's about you, you get people with different skill sets and different accesses to different um, places of power and resources. So if Berkeley as a university can do something with individuals like myself who are there, that's great. I'm imagining the true leaders for something like that are in the community. It certainly wouldn't be me. I don't live in Richmond, and I don't know that. Um, the second question about Sierra Club and diversity is, uh, ooh, I don't have time to answer that question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, I know some good people who work for Sierra Club. I mean, I do. There, there's. The thing is, it's not useful for me to paint anybody or any one organization as bad, or it's just not useful. Uh, I, think, I think organizations like Sierra Club need to revision, revisit their mission statements, because their mission statements were made at a particular time in history when, I'm sorry to say, in my humble opinion, 
Uh, it only, it represented a certain segment of the population here in this country, the experience of, the narrative of, and I think that has to be revisited. Because often what I hear from individuals who work in organizations like the Sierra Club, they are, they're beholden to the mission, but missions are not stagnant or static. They need to, there have to be live things. We live in a different, we live, we live in a different day, day and age. Hello, 2042 is around the corner, and guess who's gonna be the majority? It ain't gonna be who's in Sierra Club at the moment. Um, I, you know, let's just keep it real for just a moment, okay? So what does that mean in terms of um, the mission statement? Um, and just, so yeah, I, I could just, yeah. So we can start there with the mission statement. Somebody else say something? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I know a lot of those individuals because we work together through the uh, Southwest Network for Environmental Economic uh, Justice, Dr. Henry Clark, but I can also tell you that people of color can't do it on their own. Uh, when we've worked on issues, we say, yes, it's that, but we need the whole community to be working on this issue, and we need uh, outside forces, and I think that that's been the big uh, the big challenge when you try to leave it up just to the community to be able to fight the corporations uh, and then uh, also have a corrupt uh, government. Uh, because I think that what you have to be looking at is what the, what's the alter alternative economic base when you relocate those particular uh, facilities because you've got to make sure that you have something there for the community that's clean and safe. And I think that the council and the county should be working on uh, bringing a solar energy plant there that creates those jobs and there's a big uh, trade-off. I think that a lot of the mainstream environmental groups can lend their scientists. I know, and for Austin with the tank farm, uh, it was Dr. Neil Carmen from the Sierra Club uh, who was loaned to us to do a lot of the different research and workshops with the grassroots community and analyzing uh, the data. And so I think that there's, there's a place for all different groups to be able to help um, what's been happening in, in uh, Richmond for such a long time uh, to be able to bring that changes. My name is Karen Josephson and um, what I would like Carolyn to do, just up front, and then I'll give a tiny bit of background, is to answer the question, or tell the whole audience the answer that you gave me to the question I gave you at the break. Because, <laughs> because I what think, is that question? Because, because um, it really has shifted my brain completely, and I'm in a group called Move to Amend that has an internal education project where we're reading how to work cross-culturally, and I think we need all hands on deck for, for this big climate issue. And so I find myself in the room with people, if there is a person of color there, I find myself holding back on our discussions because I'm afraid that my can't get away from it racism that I had to have been raised with in a small town in Idaho where I saw no one other than white people so some of that institutionalized stuff, it, it, you know, the stuff that's just in me that I don't even know about, I'm afraid it's gonna leak out when I have my conversation. <laughs> so I'm measuring what I say, and oh, what if that's the wrong word? And so all of that has me hold back, and we need to be able to work together smoothly and well across all kinds of cultures and very, very quickly. So your answer was beautiful. That's a lot of pressure because now I got to how, how do we how do we talk to each other and be at ease when we have multiple cultural people in the room? So Karen, I'm going to try to remember some of the things I said because now <laughs> um, I I actually for me it's actually so I, the last thing I remember saying was about what is your larger intention. So for me, actually, it's not about being at ease, right? It's about be calling out what's actually there. And I understand the impulse to want to not to say anything because it's just too uncomfortable. What if I say something that's stupid, wrong, offensive, racist, whatever it is? And actually, you, it's another missed opportunity. So there is no getting around it, folks. Let me tell you something. I've had black skin my entire life. I can't get around it, <laughs> right? It's like there have been times in my younger days that I've tried to get around it. Sometimes I like to say to people, today I'm incognito, you know? Um, 
but I can't get around it because there it is, right? So you can't get around it and we don't have any more time. So actually call it out. It's why when I started out the talk, I just said, oh my God. And I was about to say to you all, not only am I going to be black talking about African-Americans in the environment, it's Black History Month, or as we like to call it, Black Employment Month. You know, um, so, and you know, I use humor as a way to, de to diffuse what's real in the room, you know, because I could get an alert. Why is there, you know, black history only on Black History Month? Why isn't it just American history? You know, there's all these larger questions around that. Call it out, because at the end of the day, we all make those mistakes. What I fear is like what happened for three days at the Garrison Institute, nobody said anything till I lost it in the room. And for me, no one should ever have to lose it in the room before we call out what we all already know. And just start from where you are. Start from where you are. Don't think you have to know everything in order to be able to be in conversation with difference. Just start from where you are. Was that was something yeah, like well, that? the most valuable thing was to oh. be, have the courage, and that was all very good, oh. but to have the courage, <laughs> but to have the courage to say, I'm very uncomfortable here because I'm so afraid yeah, I'm going right. to offend somebody in the room because my already racism that I don't know about is going to stick out. Well, there. I never, you notice I did not say my already racism. No, I, I said that. Okay. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's right. I said that. But, okay. But to say that in the yeah. room, okay. that was that. I'm Molly Engel. I am an academic. I've been on this campus for 16 years. Given that Oregon is a white state, and given that Corvallis is a white town, and given that OSU is a predominantly white institution, what's it like sitting up there advocating for the environment to a room full of people of privilege? <laughs> I'll, I'll go last since I've been talking. Okay. Hey, yeah, I'm an improbable person to speak to that, but um, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So yes, I'm going to come back to Carolyn's point earlier about tension and about contradiction, and I, I, I believe a lot of creativity comes out of that. Um, and I, when I moved to Madison some time ago, uh, it was the least diverse place I'd ever lived in. And I was there in my first week, and there were a bunch of freshmen walking up and down State Street, which is the middle of Madison there. And I overheard one kid say to the other, I said, I just could just walk up and down the street every day because I just love the diversity. And I thought, wow. <laughs> and then I thought, and I thought, to myself, well, I'm here because I'm going to get used to being comfortable around white people. Uh, but these kids were from the Northwoods. They had not experienced a lot of diversity, had probably met some Native people, but not uh, people internationally or white diversity. And I wanted to, and that was useful for me because I'd moved from London, from South Africa, London, New York. Uh, to get a handle on what was going on in the classroom. Because I teach around race, I teach around the environment, and I wanted to draw out both the knowledge and the insecurities of the Northwoods kids, as well as the kids who grew up in Chicago and had a different set of backgrounds. So that was an educational moment for me. Um, I had to start from where they were. Um, they had certain assumptions about me. and. Uh, one of the things that I do find encouraging is that there, it, there's a long way to go, but there is more of a, of a, of a rapprochement, uh, more of a mutual understanding or connection emerging in many different societies around the world between uh, what, what the Indian uh, historian Ram Guha calls full stomach environmentalism and empty belly environmentalism. Uh, 20 years ago, that was virtually invisible, you know, uh, that food security should be seen as an environmental, that hunger uh, it should be seen as an environmental issue is, is huge. And I think one of the, if we think of, of two of the biggest uh, crises in the world at the moment, is the environmental crisis and the inequality crisis. 
We know, and this isn't just an American thing, if you look at societies across the world, inequality is rising, you've got a hollowing out of the middle. And these two crises are linked, and the, the, the link is not always visible. But uh, the, 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 the conflicts around the environment, the devastation of the environment, is uh, exacerbated by the, the inequality crisis. So you're talking Indonesia, you're talking about Nigeria, Costa Rica, Italy, uh, Ireland, Greece, South Africa, um, many, Australia and the US. What you've seen over the past few decades is a pulling apart. And so you have this language of global flows, you have this language of trickle down, the watery images, but so much is around fortification, separation, uh, hoarding. So it has a, it, it's a circuitous way of coming back to this question of um, how do we meet people where they are uh, and accept and, and, and listen to their version of environmental values, which may be very different from ours. And I do see progress. It's slow and it's inadequate. But if I think of when I first started getting uh, engaged with environmental activism 20 odd years ago, there is a shift. Insufficient, but there is a shift. And I just want to add that I'm not academia, I'm grassroots, I don't have a degree. <laughs> but I do do a lot of work out in the community and with a lot of, uh, partner with a lot of students in the university. And I think uh, it's real important uh, to be able to share the stories uh, and for, um, for audience, like you said, this, this particular audience, I think it's important to hear the perspective of what the environment and what, what environmental justice means to people of color and people who have lived there. Because I feel that if our voice is not heard, if you never know about what has really happened in our communities and how we got there, you know, I had a lot of people say, I knew something, something was going on, but it never hit me until you said, wow, Congress passes that. Then the cities decided to segregate everybody. Then they decided to put all the horrible things in communities of color. That's how we got here. And so it's important that other people know about the story and how we got here, because sometimes uh, you don't hear about it. And you're in the universities, and sometimes you don't hear it even in the universities and you don't know what's happening out there in the community, I think that uh, sharing and exchanging knowledge and information uh, is very important. And I've always been brought up, I'll tell you real quickly, my dad used to always say, he would always say, Susana, respect everyone. And I mean everyone. And he would say, I don't care if they're black, brown, white, yellow, or green. And I'd say, Dad, you know there's no green people. <laughs> And he said, just in case they come. <laughs> and he would tell me that all the time. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and here they are. So, <laughs> and, and that's why, you know, when, when you're given those values about respect, um, it brings on a whole different meaning uh, when you're talking to people and you're sharing uh, what's going on and you're sharing that knowledge. And, you know, I think, I think my parents for, and especially my dad for, for always letting us know that. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so a couple of things I want to speak to, the idea of privilege. Um, and where'd she go? Uh, um, one of the reasons I say that I'm not an academic is not me trying to be highfalutin. It's just that as I am the only black faculty member in the College of Natural Resources at UC Berkeley, I'm it. Um, they are fighting over whether or not to give me tenure. It's been going on for a year and a half. It's 2014. Uh, one of the challenges that I have by not saying I'm an, acad an academic, because for me, I believe there's a type of assimilation that happens, that if you're an academic, you have to do research and think and write and disseminate in a very particular way, which doesn't allow for difference. So when I say that I'm not one, it's not that I'm not privileged or proud to have the opportunity to be there. It's just that I want to show up as my full self, and it's really hard for me to do that when I say I'm an academic. Uh, the issue of privilege, uh, every, for me, everyone, including all of us up here, have privilege. We don't have the same privilege at the same time in the same place, but I've got privilege. I've got a PhD. 
or as a person I know likes to say, I have my PH degree. There's some privilege there. Um, my being able to be here today, there's some privilege there. So I know what it is that you're, I think I know what it is that you're getting at by saying a room of, this room of privilege, but we all have privilege in this room. And there's something about acknowledging that. There's something about acknowledging that um, even in a, for me, even in a poor community, or when I look at my parents with a high school education and growing up in a poor town, there's a lot of privileges they clearly did not have. And this is maybe I've romanticized it in my head, but maybe it's just, or maybe it's just been a way for me to find. If I always see my parents and myself and others like me as victims, then we can never contribute fully. You know, so the privilege of be the privilege of being black and born today affords me a way of looking at the world that I like to think is a privilege. It's not, a, it's not something I've been tortured with. It's not something that just sucks to be. It it's actually gives me a certain way of coming and showing up every day. So I come into a room, and if I'm in a room with a lot of people who don't look like me or who are different than me, for me it's just about, I, I like to think about it as an opportunity. It's about relationship once again. It's about um, how I'm able to sort of stand upright in my own difference in the room and recognize not just your privilege but mine as well. Um, Oh, I'm gonna get emotional. Someone stop. Question. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm not sure if you had a question. So much was saying already. I'm sorry. I'll be back in. Okay. Hi, Gary Pizan, uh, Whidbey Island, Washington, physical therapist, uh, a long time environmental justice activist, uh, activist. Um, so many questions. I'm from Detroit. That's from the, that's from Motown. Well, and and being a, a student of this, I really come from a background of healthcare, and for me, it's been all about uh, health and happiness, really. And the underpinnings of our health and happiness is. Uh, where we live and how we live. But uh, more and more, I'll cut to the chase, uh, more and more people are beginning to question, like uh, Daniel Quinn kind of introduced the, the subject of uh, civilization being at the, root of, uh, at the root of the path we're on, but uh, more so, more focused is capitalism. Naomi yeah. Klein, Deep Green <laughs> Resistance, uh, we're beginning to question whether or not uh, we can actually survive capitalism. What do you guys think about that? Many, many people have already not survived capitalism. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> something to say about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there are a couple of things. I, Mike Davis's book, Planet of the Slums, uh, has a, an ending there uh, about the crisis of the future. And uh, I was thinking also about uh, Indra Sina's wonderful novel called Animals People about the Bhopal disaster. And he talks there about, the, ends with the crisis of the future. And it is, uh, and, and uh, Mary Louise Pratt has, has talked about this, it is uh, capitalism and more specifically neoliberal capitalism's Achilles heel, the future. You can keep building walls, you can keep grabbing more of the pie, but that just means more and more people are outside of the system. And as you lower the stakes for people, if you say, well, I've got nothing to lose, I'm only a nominal citizen, but I'm hungry. Uh, my housing is inadequate. I can't get a job. The more you create those people, the more the system is unsustainable. So it's unsustainable environmentally, and it's unsustainable if you believe that actually having a category like citizenship should be a source of pride and connectedness. And I think that is where, in particular, uh, over the last 30 uh, odd years, 
particularly since the rise of the kind of uh, Reagan Thatcher duopoly and the spread of that ideology, um, we have been moving more and more in an environmentally and politically unsustainable direction. And I was very much thinking about that this week with the, with the death of Stuart Hall, who was one of the great British radicals uh, who coined the term Thatcherism. He saw this not just as a new um, leader who was coming in in 1979, but he saw, with Reagan uh, ascending the presidency in, in 1980, and the, the kind of alliance that was created, uh, the, the deregulation, the uh, evisceration of social support for the most vulnerable citizens in an effort to get them back on their feet. All of those things, um, the idea of globalization at any cost, uh, self-policing, mega mergers, so many of the things that we've, we've experienced uh, are uh, not sustainable in the long term. And I think absolutely that is uh, the neoliberal uh, edifices Achilles heel. And we have to reverse that environmentally and in terms of the inequality crisis. Ditto. <laughs> All right, well, that was basically my question, but uh, I might add to it because it se does seem that the world economic system is a major impediment to what we're trying to do. Uh, my name is Joe Mailhot. Uh, I'm a professor at St. Martin's University up in Olympia, Washington, uh, down here to find out some good stuff about climate change. So uh, maybe uh, as you were answering the question about capitalism and its uh, way of stopping... Uh, climate justice, which is really just justice, period, really. Uh, how can we use uh, climate change as our friend to jujitsu that system? And can we do it fast enough so that we don't kill ourselves while it's happening? Who's we? <laughs> The we that need capitalism to change so that the human species may survive. Who's we? I, I'm really serious. Like I know I, you're making, I know there's a general, like you mean that's, who's that? Well, I guess uh, it would be anyone who, who, wants, uh, who wants capitalism no longer to uh, make life impossible on the planet. Because so you know, there are certain people who would not view it that way and they're not going to be participating in any kind of jujitsu move. Well, I, I want to say to you that, and I, I, you know, I often go back to my family and I do it just to, I mean, I could talk about <coughs> other people, but to kind of keep it in the eye. Um, my father would not like to see capitalism jujitsu. Ju um, and this is for me where it's complex. It's, it, it, the conversation is easy if we think, well, simply, I, and I believe there are a lot of poor people who have suffered under capitalism, um, and there's a small percentage of people who have gained a lot. But for me, there's a lot of people in the middle who fought hard to be able to get the benefits of capitalism, and they are not ready to give it up. And, they, and I, it's hard to imagine them, because some of us feel like we have the privilege of standing on the outside and going, but can't you see what it's doing to you? And actually, they'll have a different story. So that's why I'm always, for me, it's a hard answer. Because if some of those people were sitting at this table, they wouldn't sit in either one camp or the other. They're somewhere in the middle. And they, they kind of like the fact they can finally have a second car. They finally like the fact they can maybe actually own a home. They kind of like the fact that they can take a vacation. They kind of like the fact they can finally send their kids to school. And you're about to tell them that capitalism sucks. So you know we have to give it up. And, well, they've got, they're, they're buying into the consumer. They can consume these things, right? So, and for them, it, it plays out. It makes their lives work in the way that they work today. And so in a way, what I'm hearing is we're asking them, we, 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 I'm asking them, or you're asking to give it up or to use climate change to change it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But for me, it's a much more complicated question. 
Because what about all those other, what about those people? And I'm not assuming everyone here in this room wants to give it up either. Capitalism. I don't know who, I don't know who them is. Well, I guess the, the question was predicated on the idea that without giving up capitalism, the power structures will remain and there won't be any incentive for them to stop creating climate change. Anybody else want to, I, I get you. I mean, them I get are you. the power structures. Um, yeah, I think I, I was, we have an environmental film festival every two years in Madison called Tales from Planet Earth, and we should, one of the documentaries that really moved me this year was uh, a documentary called Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. Um, and there were various Inuit uh, leaders who were talking there about not just the impact of climate change, but the impact on climate change of what constitutes knowledge and what they feel they have to pass on to succeeding generations because the wind patterns have changed. So when people go out hunting, um, the, the way, the, the kind of formations in the ice and snow carved by the wind would be used as, as, as directional vectors. The winds have changed, that has shifted. So um, climate change in that sense is eroding knowledge and it's changing the balance of power intergenerationally as well. Now these things are happening across communities, across very different cultures in the world. Some of it has to do with capitalism, some of it doesn't. I think in, I don't want to generalize, but there are circumstances where climate change can uh, create, can foment new debates around growth, around poverty, around what constitutes wealth and what constitutes knowledge. Um, and I think that in those places, uh, and I've been some of those places, it is constructive. Uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the myths and something that's almost a cliche in environmental circles is that we've got a population problem because everybody in the world wants to be an American. Okay. Uh, in my experience, it's, uh, and, and mine's a limited experience, but it, but it's, it crosses several societies, um, what I most often encounter is people saying that they want more control over their choices. And sometimes those choices are such that they become unwilling urban residents because uh, some transnational monocultural palm oil plant came in and what had been a commons, what had been unowned land suddenly vanishes. That portion of the family, the extended family pie that they depended on is gone and people are driven into the favelas or whatever. So it's not that they're, that they're on one path to becoming an American and, you know, <coughs> overburdening the planet. They're just, it's how do we keep as many paths open for people as possible and climate change and, and, I, and I do think the extremes of neoliberal capitalism uh, create these bottlenecks of choices and people feel that uh, there's, there's one model or a limited set of models of development that are being imposed on them and if you don't choose those, you're screwed and if you choose them, you're also screwed. So it's, it's those kind of, of things that I think we, 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 we should try to open up as best we can. Okay, so we're, uh, <clears throat> we're starting to run out of time here, so we're going to have to close questions uh, and try to get to uh, who we have left, but we will not be able to take any more, anyone else who's in the queue. So we'll try to get to as many folks who are still left in the queue as possible in our time, but uh, we can't take any more at this time, unfortunately. So we'll go here. My name is Heike Williams, and um, I have a question with a we in it, and I will define the we. So... Um, how can we overcome the inertia of uh, uh, initiating transformation, you know, in, because of climate change? And the, and I could say we are, how can they overcome inertia or the lack of motivation? So, and the we is uh, for one, um, um, like people like me who is, does not really, we, I do not really hurt right now. 
And then it's, we all know that, you know, when we start hurting, then we're motivated to do exercise. As long as we don't hurt, we just do what we're doing. So if, if something happens in our backyard, environmentally, people get active, you know, but it's, that's not happening yet, you know, you're just, you're just fine. You know, so it's like the certain, I notice with myself, there is, I'm unconscious, I kind of am somewhat informed, and, but there is like, there's an inertia, and I see a lot, not just me, a lot of people around it, who, what prevents you to do something. And then like the they is more like the, the politicians. Uh, like there, there's some doctors from this community who went to Washington to um, support or kind of drum up support for a, a single payer um, health uh, healthcare system. And they were told, and they met with a lot of pet petition, um, politicians and they were told, well, yeah, that's a good idea, but right now it's political and not feasible. You know, so it's like, um, so there's more to, no motivation there to change something. And I'm like, you know, there's no motivation to change our political system. So there's also like an inertia or lack of motivation there. So do you have any idea, you know, how we can overcome the uh, lack of motivation, uh, inertia, kind of to set this thing go going where we all know we need to. I mean, it's, it's already over time. Thank you. I want to ask the question of what inspires you, you know? So some of the stories I was telling you about today are people who um, work with people who have always operated, their lives are challenging. They've been constantly challenging. They've been hurting arguably their whole lives, previously incarcerated men and women, um, people who are poor and black and can't have the, aren't, don't have a, set of, a wider set of choices to, to choose from. And many of those stories, they didn't, I don't know how to say, I'm not trying to, I know what you mean, so this isn't an attack or anything, but at the end of the day, part of me asked the question is, it's, it's partly your job to figure that out, what inspires you. So, I, for myself, it's my job. I look, I look for that inspiration because I try to figure out what is that. And then I think, what is it that inspires me? What is it that I love? What's going to motivate me? Somebody asked me the question, what do you have faith in? And that really that blew me away because at first I went, do you mean like religious? They're like, whatever. What do you have faith in? Because you have to figure out what's going to get you up every day to make those choices. And some of it for me is just bad habits. So it's, you know, and you look for ways to find, to be supported in that, to have it reinforced for yourself, whether it's joining other groups or uh, taking a class. I don't know what it is that you do, but I think this is where we have to do our own work around this. I don't think there's a magic bullet answer. I think, you know, even today I'm listening to Susanna's story and I'm listening to the stories that Rob has said. All of those were, some of those I hadn't heard from before. I'm always looking for the more, there's a critical mass of those stories and those movements and those people. The examples are right there. We actually don't have to go anywhere if we just look at those stories and then try to make a connection for us. What do, what do we have faith in? What inspires us? What's going to move us to get up and start exercising every day instead of just once a week? I mean, it's not a satisfactory answer, but it's the only answer I have right now because I'm asking the same question of myself. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that education and role play is very important uh, because there's a book written, it's called The Wealth of Poverty, and it was written by uh, Pastor Tina Carter and another colleague of hers, and what they do is that... Um, as they work with a lot of the, the people, they ask these questions and they put them in role plays and they began to ask, well, what, what would you feel like if, if you were homeless or in your street? You know, they just ask a series of questions of the, of the people who are going through these workshops and so forth. And, so, and, and most of these people are privileged people. So it's sort of like letting them first hear a story and then how to address it, but then come back and give alternatives. And I think that it's awakening the consciousness and it's also saying you have to get out there. You have to be in those communities. You have to be doing this and that. You have to take on a friend. You have to build those relationships. 
And I think that the isolation is probably one of the worst things is that when we isolate ourselves and we get in those comfort modes, because I can tell you, uh, coming from my background, uh, from a background of poverty uh, all my life, not realizing it though, uh, until I was older, uh, I had I had the privilege uh, to receive a scholarship when from the Wind Call, and I don't know if you know that, but they give like people who are activists, uh, they give them two weeks to kind of. Um, just relax and just take a break from all the activism and stuff. And so I went up uh, past Tacoma in this little community. It was a solar house. It had everything. You could, they filled the refrigerator and they had a cook who wasn't just a cook, he was an artist. And so everything looks beautiful out there, you know. And if you didn't want to eat, you didn't have to. The only thing was you had to detach. You couldn't bring cell phone or computer. You had to detach and all that. And you could go down and you could go kayak and you could be at the beach every day. And when I sat there, I thought, wow, this is how the rich people live. <laughs> and I said, no wonder they don't know what's going on. You know? <laughs> Because they're all so isolated down here, you know? And I just kept thinking, and I kept wanting to organize the other two people who were there. <laughs> <laughs> and we kept having to tell ourselves, wait, we're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be just kicking back and relaxing. <laughs> but that, that, that really even showed me more about, you know, how this detachment and isolation from the reality that the other 99% or even lower than that, the people at the bottom are really going through that. No one has any idea about what's really happening. And so I think that we really have to get in touch with what's really happening and be able to share those stories and, and to help motivate. It's our job to help motivate other people. It's not just you yourself, because if we're a, if we're a village and we're a family and we're a community, it's not about self. It's about all of us. And so it, it is our responsibility to motivate others and to educate others about what's really happening. Yeah, I was uh, listening the other day to the radio and it was about uh, some activists in the Amazon and, and this group of activists have been trying to stop some colonist uh, settlers coming in uh, to the land and into the, the forest uh, and some of those protesters were killed um, by these by these sort of uh, colonial goons uh, and and one of the when the protesters on the radio he was anonymous uh, self-protection he said uh, those people were dead to the eye before they were killed and it really jumped out at me and I thought yeah that's exactly right is that people are targeted in the knowledge that they're already semi-invisible that they, their deaths won't be reported, equally weighted with the death of the visible. And that. So I think, you know, coming back to what Susanna was just saying, uh, this uh, people amplifying the, the, their visibility, amplifying their voices, and people in privileged positions listening to those voices and asking how can we help, how can we connect, um, are there opportunities, not that we're dictating, but that we can, can we can we help widen some of those pathways? What do you suggest? Um, and I and I think there is around these environmental struggles, particularly empty belly environmentalism uh, in 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 the global south, which is what I know best, uh, where groups are targeted because they're dead to the eye, and 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 so as as activists as people who work in different medium, as people who work in education, one of the roles we can play is by uh, tapping into those stories and, and helping amplify those voices in the way that uh, uh, Susanna and, and Carolyn were doing today uh, and bringing those stories to life, giving, giving them faces, giving them texture and saying, this is what this person says, it's very different from where you're coming from, how do you feel about that, how does that connect or not connect. Um, and I think the more conversations there are like that, the more uh, openings we, we, we contribute to, uh, the, the, the fewer people who are dead to the eye, there will be out there. 
I have to add something yep. to uh, Suzanne that you were saying that I absolutely agree with, but I want to clarify it for this audience. It is, a, it is about community. It's not only about self. And one of the feedback that I got from a lot of um, communities of color, people, individuals who work, it is not their responsibility to teach you what you need to know. And so there's a, that's why I really emphasize, because they get tired. I've heard that for fatigue, it's just like whenever I show up, I'm supposed to explain to you everything to educate you. And actually, that's not what relationship is. So while I agree it is important for all of us, I want to clarify that we all have to do, there, for me, there is a little amount of individual work as well as community work that has to happen in order to have a relationship that is reciprocal not draining a community that's already drained and at the edges of its resources. Yeah. Sorry, I just yeah. have to add that, right? Hi, my name is Amaris Franz, and I'm a member of a pretty well-connected community in Corvallis. Um, <coughs> and as, through that, we've had conversations about how to be resilient through a change, either apocalyptic or transformational. And, out of that came a dream for me to connect with other neighbors, neighborhoods that we don't understand as well. Um, and part of that came out of fear. What are they gonna do when we're, when we're ready and they're not? And I realized that's not a safe place, that's not a safe place in humanity to be. Um, you've answered so many questions. I've already drafted five questions today and you've answered for just about every single one of them. So I don't know if I have a question left over. Um, part of that, just in the last, you mentioned assessment, Carol, and, Carolyn, and then Susanna, I think. Um, you talked about going through the neighborhood, and I always walk through nature. And I'm gonna go west this time, and I walk through the other neighborhoods that I might have those fears of, and yet that I have an open heart and open-mindedness towards. And do that assessment, which sounds like I'm gonna be able to get those connections and an assessment to figure out where the next step is to meet this goal for me to make, bridge these cultural gaps. Do you have any other advice? One, as I go through this. <laughs> Susanna said she's going to go where? <laughs> Outside of her neighborhood. All right, you know, one, I think, and I think it's great. I mean, what, so the core of what I'm getting, hearing from you is saying, open and, and taking a different direction than you've gone forward, I think is great. I think I would say to you, if you're going into a neighborhood where you have not been invited, mm -hmm. would, you, would we go into anybody's house? Where, you know, there's something like about, if I heard you right, is it for me, is that, can you build, is there a relationship that you can build? Is there a connection you can make? Um, we some, will be dependent on each other at some point, whether it's apocalyptic or transformational, and we are now, we just aren't acknowledging it. So uh, about a couple of months ago, um, I was on the news, and I believe it was in Detroit, a black woman very late at night um, found herself, the car had died, she knocked on a door, the, it opened, a white man shot her to death. Um, it was, it was a- It was a guy? It was a guy. But no, I, yeah, I think, oh, the, yes, it was another story, okay. right. It's unfortunate, it was more than one. And I say this about being in a neighborhood, so, because I want to turn it on its head just a little bit, because she was in a gated community, um, or in a, a well-to-do community. So, I, now I'm not saying this is what's going to happen to you, right? No, the irony here, as you say that, is that neighborhood is the first place I lived in, Cor in Corvallis, 21 years ago. So I've been there before. Right. I tap into that part. Right. So and maybe I will, and maybe I'll be more vulnerable this time around, 20 years later, and maybe not. Well, well, my suggestion I'm, I'm is. I'm talking about bridging these cultures. Uh, yeah, I, and my suggestion is, is always, uh, is is finding someone in that neighborhood, That's whether it's a neighborhood <laughs> association president, yes. uh, whether it's a, a particular yes. church, a particular group. I would sit down with that particular person yes. because all it takes is that first relationship to go to them and say, yes. you know, how can we work together? You know, I'm, I'm here and I want to, I want to work, but I'm not sure what needs to be done. And, and it always takes time to build those relationships. Sometimes you can hit them up really, really quickly. 
And sometimes it takes a little bit, but I think it's all about relationship, relationship. You have to build that relationship. But it's only going to take that one person, and from then it'll grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Uh, my name is Marsha Olson. Um, the, our, the name of this conference is Transformation Without Apocalypse. And I think we know that if we continue on our path, we know where the apocalypse will come from. I'm more interested in the transformation. And I've heard you mention relationship, reciprocity, community, all these things that we need to work on. We're not just an I, we're, we're, where are we? We need to be in relationship across communities. It seems to me that the thing that we need to do is a change of heart so that we understand the full reciprocity of our interdependence. And we keep taking, we meaning Western culture, it keeps taking Earth's resources and we don't even say thank you. We just keep grabbing. We take more than we need because we want. How can we change people's heart? How can we help people open their hearts so they understand that we're so dependent on the earth that if we don't change the way we see things, we're not needed here. <laughs> I mean, humans aren't needed to keep the earth alive unless you believe in complete reciprocity that we're adding, that we can add to the earth, even with our gratitude. So how do you see the work that you're doing or that we can do can open hearts as well as action and minds. I have an answer, I just feel like I'm talking too much. So. <coughs> <coughs> well, go for it then. How do we change hearts, right? So, well, part of it is, you know, I, There's a certain honesty, I think, that has to be sort of laid bare about each of us and who we are in this conversation and what our privileges are and what our power is and where we stand. Um, I often find that um, we all don't, we, um, some of us, some of us don't like to admit that we have certain kinds of power. Our ability, what are we willing to risk to lose? Or, you know, a risk to gain, I should say. What are we willing to risk to gain? And that, for me, is really powerful because when we have to really identify what we're willing to lose, like we're willing to take a risk because there's something more important to gain. And I find that that's a really difficult thing for us to do because we often, I often feel like I have to hold on to what I have because this may be it and I won't survive if I don't have it. Am I willing to risk it? Are you willing to risk your home? Are you willing to risk your job? Are you willing to risk being outed from your community, whatever that community is? Are you, willing, are you willing to risk your health? Are you willing to risk your life? You know, we've heard, when I hear about people today like Ken Sarawiwa, they gave up their life. I'm sorry, that shit is deep. When we hear those stories all the time, I just, if I sit with that just for a minute and have to ask, what am I willing to do? Am I willing to give up my life because, I'm a, you know, because of transformation or my fear of apocalypse? I'm a, actually not, I'm not quite there yet because I like my life. I like living. So I'm trying to find another way out <laughs> or another way through, you know? But I'd like to think that maybe I could get there. So that's for me the question of what are we willing to risk to gain? And if we can identify what that is, maybe we can start making different kinds of choices. The change of heart comes for me when I hear those kinds of stories. And I connect, I went, oh my God, that, when I, I started off showing you that story of Jack and Draca, I was moved to tears. I know it's quite the 15 year old boy because his joy and his total commitment and his total belief in transformation was, and creativity, it was completely, I hope nobody destroys that in him because that's what we're gonna need actually to transform, it's right there. So. I, I would follow up because I definitely uh, agree with my sister here. I think we need to take off our shoes though. Mm -hmm. I really do. Because that is the aura and that's the connection to the earth. And too many of us have not touched the earth. 
We do not touch the earth, and it's not to you touch the earth with your body and your feet. Do you then receive that energy and that connection to the earth? I see so much disconnection now, where parents don't want their children to get dirty. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not of the earth. I mean, we used to eat dirt. It was kind of like mandatory. To, we had to eat dirt, you know. You had to get eat dirt, get dirty, get in the creeks. You had to do, you know, this all this stuff that now goes in the university about assessment, community assessment. We were doing that a long time ago. We knew where the plum trees were, the peach trees. We knew which creek was deep at what particular time and so forth. And that was just from being out in nature. And that enough of that is not really happening. And I think that um, that faith and religion has to play a bigger part in that also. Uh, because, you know, through our indigenous ways, as we look at the four directions and you look at the four elements, what is it that holds that together? And it's the love. Love. It's love and it's a heart and we all have it. We all have heart and we all have love and we just have to really open that love uh, for our Mother Earth and for ourselves. And so I think that um, I can't tell you, you know, when, we, when the gentleman this morning played the drum, you know, that's the symbolization, the drum is the heart. Uh, and so if we don't take off our shoes, if we don't walk the earth, we become more and more disconnected. And we see it with this new generation who doesn't even want to be outside because they're just with their gadgets. And, and, and even the college students, you know, I got invited to this one cafe. It was in my community, brand new, hadn't been there. And they said, no, I'll meet you there. I said, oh yeah, I know where that's at. I go in there. And I was like in the twilight zone <laughs> because I saw all these young people and no one was talking to it. They weren't talking to each other. I don't know if they were texting to each other but because they all had these gadgets and stuff. And I, I really, I just, it was so quiet in there and I just didn't know what to think. And then I went outside and again, I saw all these people in the patio, but they were all doing the same thing. And so that's why I say we have to disconnect and we have to get back to, to the earth because that when we, you can feel the earth and you feel it underneath your feet, then you appreciate it. And, and for me, it might be simple. I know it can get really complex, but for me, it can be very simple. Yeah, I think also, I, 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 I mean, I, it's hard to, how much you prepare to risk, uh, feel the earth, uh, feel the love, express the love. Uh, and, uh, a lot of my work has been around expression, around finding ways to tell stories differently, finding ways to surprise. I remember the, the New Yorker critic, um, Anthony Lane, once after watching an environmental movie, says, there's no such thing as eco-drama. You always know the moral outcome in advance. Okay? <laughs> so what's, what stories can break through that inertia, can surprise? Uh, I'm thinking of a movie like um, Even the Rain about Cochabamba and uh, the struggle against the privatization of water there. You're thinking of uh, Promised Land about fracking, you're thinking about documentaries like this Inert and Climate Change. And just at a, at a sort of local level, uh, I, I was involved in, in setting up the MFA program at uh, University of Wisconsin about 10 years ago. And one of the big discussions we had at the beginning was there are these uh, elite uh, programs that help train people to be storytellers, give them an opportunity to write stories across the country where people come out with an MFA, $80,000 in debt, or else they came in as trust affairs and they leave as trust affairs, okay? And they're telling the same type of stories from the same type of backgrounds. And we said, whatever we set up, we don't want that to be. So we set up a small program where people don't get in debt, and as a result, we've had much more diverse students, uh, the diverse within the US and from abroad, people telling different stories, and there are stories that I would never have encountered in the classroom had the funding structure been different. So I think this question of love, risk, expression, uh, 
it takes institutional forms as well. We make institutional choices about <coughs> what kind of structures will invite uh, um, stories that surprise us, stories that we didn't know were environmental. And I think that's one of the things we've been talking about today is what counts as an environmental story can surprise us. And then you go back to a writer and you think, well, that person's not an environmentalist. Uh, and, and, but if you read through them, against the grain, you'll say, see, wow, that is a different way of looking at what it meant to live in Harlem in the 1930s, or whatever the, the story is. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you all. All right, let us please show our gratitude to these three speakers this afternoon.